Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Hope we've all had a good week. It's trying to, uh, sun's trying to shine here, so it's been really rainy last 24 hours, so I was glad to see that. Uh, we'll start as we normally do with, with questions. And, and last couple of sessions, we have talked a lot about Genesis, particularly creation story and uh, trying to gain some understanding about that. And uh, I have a question myself, but I'm going to see, wait and see if, uh, see if we have any other questions. I, I don't think Angela's here, but I want to put this out there. Angela, we are, we are aware of your question, and uh, we know you had to work today, but we will get to it when you have some free time, okay? Because you had a couple of questions. But anyone else, any, anything that... that uh, come to your attention. Any questions or comments? Okay, no one. Um, I had a question for, for George. I, I, George mentioned something. Uh, he said it last night, but he said it last Monday is when I got it got my attention. George said, talked about organic consciousness. And I tried to look that up and I saw two different things. Uh, one of them talked about really collective consciousness when a group of people or society uh, come together and they look at what they have in common. They look at what those values are, what is needed for that society. And, and, and the other one talked about uh, getting back to nature, getting back to uh, the, the rawness of it and, and, and what, what that means as far as your beliefs and your value system. So uh, what, what George, what, what is your definition of a uh, uh, organic consciousness, if you will, or anybody can take a shot at it for that matter. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, you know, when, when we were speaking, so with regards to consciousness, and um, I was speaking about organic matter, uh, cosmic universal matter, and earthly matter. But basically, all of that manifested, you know, again, you know, out of the eternal waters. And so, in looking at nature and looking at organic uh, matter in terms of our consciousness, it talks about the various fluids in terms of uh, water that we look at in naturally in terms of um, H2O, but this talks about the plasma. This talks about all of the substance that's you know, related to the eternal waters. So for an example, I mean, if we talk about organic matter, it refers to like the feminine amniotic fluids. And again, this is all in reference to, um, you know, organic matter now. And it talks about the masculine, you know, uh, uh, semen in terms of uh, like the liquids that carry life into existence. You know, it talks about, you know, again, the, um, the hidden waters and how we look at it, you know, in terms of, um, the masculine and the feminine aspect of polarity. So when I was talking about organic matter, you know, it related it to water, but it gave us um, an overview where we can look at it from various aspects of matter. And so when we talk okay. about beginning, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's, so I just want, yeah, it, it does. I, so, so, that sounds a lot to me like uh, a statement Pastor made as well when he talked about uh, 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 creating the environment, that, that, that environment. So you're saying these are the resources that we have to create from. And this is, uh, you know, looking at it in a, a physical sense, but all of this is spiritual, of course. You're saying this is the the uh, the substance from which cru uh, the, the 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 earth or the world was created, for lack of a better way of saying it, 
even though it, it was all spiritual at the time. Uh, and these are the same substances that we use today to create from. Is that what you're saying? It, it, and uh, am I am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, no, I'm not. Right, you're understanding it um, in the way that I, I perceive it, specifically speaking in reference to the organic matter. Now, when we talk about, you know, like the five major liquid systems of organic life, you know, which include the blood, the slim, the hormones, the mucus, and the, plas the plasma, you know, all of that is the substance of matter. And I think that as we become more aware, and I specifically you know, are looking at how science, you know, connects to spirituality, which at some point before it was like kind of like separate where, you know, yeah. it wasn't talked about in that same context. But now I can see it more, you know, more visibly or more spiritually in terms of how they are connected. And so, you know, being able to go back and uh, look at organic matter like the sun, you know, the sun gives life. And I think now to see it more from the, um, the DNA or to see it, you know, from other, you know, means of um, science, I think it's helpful, if, if that makes sense. Okay. Or if anyone else want to respond to that. Thank you, George. Well, I would like to add to that, George. Um, yeah, go ahead. The... Um, uh, the idea of organic consciousness in reference to the universe. It talks about a universal consciousness, a universal uh, awareness, and <clears throat> that existed um, before there was the organic body, meaning that the essence of being, the essence of becoming, uh, was is the substance through which the mind came into existence. And that mind of, of which we are speaking uh, is the mind of the uh, human or the mind of any animal, any living source for that matter, uh, even the mind of a tree. So we are being, meaning that we are a being in this earth and we are also becoming. The question is, what are we becoming? What we are becoming depends on what we have an affinity for. Because the, the, um, the uh, translation, the literal translation of what happened when the Adam uh, was um, um, confronted with um, having, for lack of a better term, so we all can understand it, when the Adam was confronted about having eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, at that point, it says that the Adam stopped becoming. So I, I, I take from that, that becoming speaks to the um, idea of awakening to an awareness of, uh, of the reality that you are spirit as opposed to this organic matter that makes up the the, uh, the body. And this idea of the of our, the our universal mind or the organic mind um, is, is universal in that anyone, uh, all of us rather, draws from that, that uh, universal mind and not without realizing sometimes that we are talking about spiritual energy. I hope that makes sense. And the reason it's called organic consciousness is because it is the consciousness of um, all living things that's drawn, that comes from the universe itself. George, is that in con uh, conjunction with what you were saying? Uh, uh, ab absolutely. And I think, again, in terms of us realizing that in the beginning, you know, it, uh, it says, well, in Genesis, in the beginning, God. And I think that the spiritual aspect of who we are, the energy that we are, you know, first starts with the spiritual matter, the spiritual uh, consciousness. 
and then it manifested into physical, you know, evolution. So definitely it, it, it's spirit, and I think that's why the waters, you know, play such a significant, you know, in humanity, and I think to be able to see it from the spiritual aspect from the beginning, you know, helps to move us through this process, if that uh, makes sense. No spirit. No. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Anyone? Okay. Um, Pastor. Yep. Talk to us about the name Amen. Um, this is very interesting. Well, when we say amen, we have been taught that it means so let it be. Um, that is the um, Greco uh, Roman translation of it. In, in, Re in Revelations, when Jesus says that I am the amen, um, but Jesus is actually saying is uh, Amen. I am Amen. And Amen is um the God of um Upper Egypt and Ra Lower Egypt. So when Jesus says I am the Amen, um, amen I am Amen, he is talking about being the spiritual essence of uh, the the uh, mystics who were recognized uh, in, um, in Egypt as being the, um, one with uh, the uh, creative being uh, that brought everything into existence. And when, um, the, when the lower and upper Egypt became one, um, it became Amon Ra. Um, so what is actually talking about is the same thing, uh, creation itself. Now, to explain what I just said, um, Amon is speaking to spiritual creation, uh, is speaking to spiritual essence. So when Jesus said that, I am Amon, Jesus was saying, I am the spiritual essence of everything that is. Uh, we were lied to. And, and believe you me, I have dealt with um, all men uh, during my tenure as a preacher slash teacher for years and to come upon that and see um, that we were wrong, that I was wrong about it uh, I needed I need to what needed to uh, talk about this uh, and, and, and bring some sense of um, understanding to it before I go any further anyone want to add to that? to that or ask a question about it. Hey, yeah, this is Nick, good morning. Good morning. Um, I just wanna say in general, the every practitioner of spirituality or uh, any mystery school or mystical system would have been aware of the uh, sort of spiritual contributions that come out of the system that was present in Egypt. And it's a maybe a different sense than what we've normally talked about or you may have normally heard of in terms of the, the Egypt in the Bible and the way that that is spoken about. Um, but it has to do with the nature of how spiritual traditions translate over time and how they are reinterpreted uh, depending on the place on the earth where people are learning about them. But the sort of knowledge and teachings and traditions that came out of Egypt permeated all of that region of the world. And so they were very much known to uh, rabbis or more particularly people who were interested in the more uh, mystical and spiritual aspects of their particular traditions. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else <clears throat> or any questions? Um, when we, one of the other things that I think we, we look at when we are talking about Kemet, and I want us to get accustomed to saying Kemet as opposed to Egypt, but um, one of the other things that we get, um, that we see is that Egypt or Kemet is the opposite of everything that we have learned, everything that we've been taught. What do I mean by that? Where else is it that a river flows north? Where, where other place, when you talk about lower Egypt and upper Egypt, we mentioned, uh, Audrey mentioned this when we were talking last night, uh, that lower Egypt is in the north and upper Egypt is in the south. If we talk about that uh, in, in the way we have been taught, then our mind tells us that lower Egypt must be in, uh, in the south, lower Kemet must be in the south, and the upper has to be in the north based upon how we've been taught. Now, could this mean something to us? Could this be a, uh, um, this is not an anomaly, this is purposeful. But at such a time as this, everything that has come out of Kemet and the spiritual, the spiritual essence of our being um, has been turned upside down. Uh, it has been turned on its head. And that creates a difficulty in, uh, in um, bringing it right side up or flipping it where it's supposed to be. Am I making sense so far? So, so what I'm, I'm I'm saying is that the the clearer understandings of spirituality, whether they appear in the Bible, or whether they appear uh, in the in the uh, the Book of the Dead, uh, the Comedic Book of the Dead, or the Comedic uh, Tree of Life, it doesn't matter. All the answers are coming from Kemet. All the understandings are coming from Kemet. And I'll, and I'll give you one. Um, let me ask a question before I do that. Uh, are there any questions or comments? So if everything being turned upside down, then uh, the purpose of it is... This is a, a material thing. Existence or geographical um, uh, uh, cosmic matter, or that we can see, it's a message to those who are searching. It's a message to those who are mystics. It's a, it's a message to those who are growing, not growing, but expanding their desire to understand spirituality. And the message that's in, in it has been there uh, ever since Kemet existed. So it's always been there, but it has not always been understood. And I believe that we are understanding now because our task, our journey is different than any journey that has ever been in the earth. And uh, what I'm saying is that the message is that if spirituality has its genesis in Egypt or in, in Kemet, if um, mysticism has its origin in Kemet, the Bible has its origin uh, in Kemet, everything in the world does, especially when it speaks to spirituality, then that means that Christianity, Islam, Judaism, etc., has um, actually taken everything and made it what they wanted to be, which means that it, it was turned upside down. Uh, it is it, it, in the message of, of up and lower Kemet and the, the flowing of the Nile River are messages to that. Does that make sense? Well, that's what, that's what I was thinking, that it, everything was flipped upside down to change the narrative. There you go. That that that's that in itself says it in a nutshell, and it did. It changed the narrative 
because everything's spiritual. We thought it, we were taught that it was the money. Um, all those, um, uh, all the um, images in Egypt that that are personifications of spiritual energy. Uh, we were told that they were gods that were being worshipped when they're not. In that regard, they were turned upside down. Uh, is that clear? If it's not clear, just say it's not clear. If you don't understand, just say, I don't understand. And uh, um, even though you may not know how to form it in a question, okay? Is there an understanding? Okay. Everybody on the phone. Yeah, everybody on the phone. Thank you, Nick. We'll be silent most of the time. I missed okay. that. Huh? What? What'd you say? He said he missed something that you said. Looks like he might be frozen. frozen. Yeah. Um, Ron. I said, I missed it. My, okay, you can't I'm, be. I, can you hear me? Okay, go ahead. I'm. I'm just. Have, I might have to go to my telephone Zoom. Okay, go ahead. You can try turning up your camera as well. It's not. Turn your camera off. Nick. Nick said, if you turn your camera off, it may work. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, would you mind repeating that last part Audrey said, the last thing I heard Audrey said, or uh, the reason to change the narrative, the reason why things are done that way, what did I miss? Um, I don't think you missed much because I think what I did was um, simply uh, acknowledge what Audrey was saying. Okay. All right, sorry. And that's no repeat our uh, reason to apologize go ahead sound like my brother Ron? i have a question okay go ahead is good morning is that why we're dealing the world is in the shape that is in because of the lies and everything was turned upside down yes ma'am um, and it was turned upside down on purpose until there was a, a type of a dumb in the earth to bring balance to the earth. And I think now we're, with this understanding of the message uh, with the river, as well as our up and lower tenant, with that understanding, I, I think that we have a better sense of what balance looks like. I, th I think we have a better uh, grasp of what balance, spiritual balance looks like. Um, because what we have seen uh, is the uh, uh, what unbalanced, being unbalanced look like, being out of harmony, we've seen what that looks like. And, and seeing what that looks like um, has brought us to this place where we are bringing order to chaos. Does that help you, Evan? Of course, and everyone it else. It does. <clears throat> it does. And I think about, and I don't know if you want to go here, but I think about when George talked about organic consciousness is the fluid that runs down the spinal cord. Is that not the now? Or is it a representation of the now? I don't, I don't know, I don't see it as being the, a representation. Yes, I do, because it doesn't go down. It goes, it goes up, it comes up as a result of having been yes. in this complex. So it goes up, yes. Uh, it could very well be. I, I have not uh, looked at it from that perspective, but I'm not in denial that um, that's not it. Neither am, am I able to uh, say emphatically that it is. Uh, anyone else has I said, anyone have any insight on that? Please speak. Um, yeah, because 
when we talk about our body, I'm sorry, but when we talk about everything that George and, and, and we talked about this morning, it, it plasma and everything, that's, that those are the makings of us. So when he said that, I thought, started thinking about the plasma and everything. So, yeah, that was my reason for asking that question. But I, I'm done. Thank you. Go ahead, Nick. Um, I have heard that before, and I actually am in agreement with uh, most of that idea. The idea being that everything that we see physically represented at very uh, sort of spiritual sites um, is a mirror of the universe and is a mirror of us, uh, how we are constructed uh, physically as a reflection of spirit. So that whole uh, region is very much a uh, mirror of us physically and the universe, uh, as I said. So like, yes, as your spinal fluid travels up, um, so does the Nile flow from the south to the north. It's a uh, and the points along the Nile, the temples, are also uh, connected to different aspects of the self that are engaged or realized when you uh, begin spiritual practice and you begin investigating the nature of the self. Um, so all of those things are very much connected. And it's not necessarily like a one-to-one -one, uh, in terms of what is along the Nile and the things that are sort of represented in yourself, uh, not necessarily, but it is, I believe it's very much in line with that uh, idea. Um, it vibrates very strongly with that uh, aspect of ourselves. It is very much an attempt to recreate the self. And as you go through the sort of mystery school system and you advance, and this is how it was done, as you advance uh, through the various levels of initiation, go to different points along the Nile, uh, representing different points in the self, representing different degrees, for lack of a better term, of spiritual uh, attainment. Thank you. So, so let, me, let me see if I can get some clarity. So what you are, saying is that we are actually Kemet. Yes, Which, sir. Um, and, and that is, that, that in itself speaks volumes about uh, our existence. We are, if we are Kemet, and and uh, based on what uh, Nick shared with us, I can see that. And the question that Evelyn raised, of course, um, we are Kemet, meaning that we are representative or, or of the um, the essence of spirituality, because the center of mysticism is in Kemet. Slash, of course, we talk about Egypt. So it, us being our structures um, and the fluids that flow through us, especially the spinal fluid, because it flows to our mind. I mean, to our brain, where our our mind uh, exists. So that in itself gives us, um, me anyway, a, deep in the, a, a much deeper desire uh, for understanding the mysticism of uh, Kimmy. Um, when, we, when we talked last night, we, um, we talked about that mysticism. We, we, we met, and for those of you on the phone who was, who was not with the teachers when we met, um, we talked, we met to understand the mysticism in Egypt. And um, we ended up just talking uh, as opposed to going through the technical aspects of it. But we covered every aspect of the mysteries and, and the uh, energy source forces that that are in Kemet. Uh, would you guys uh, say that? that we covered it just in talking about it without having to do an academic study of it. Just, it Absolutely. Uh, yes. And, and that's, that was our goal. Actually, that was not our goal. Our goal was to get to a place where we could talk about it freely and everyone understand it. Our, but we ended up realizing after the fact 
that we have an, a, a better understanding than we thought we did. So how did that happen? Desire infused us with the reality of what uh, the energies of Kemet are. And that's why we were able to discuss it more freely. And we, uh, we believe, I believe, all of us believe uh, that the, the understandings of Kemet are, are present in everyone who has listened or desired to hear and understand what we're talking about. So why do I say that? Uh, because um, all what we begin to see, like Amon, um, Amon, Amon the uh, Ra, uh, instead of Amen, Amon, where did the answer come from? Uh, came from Kemet. All answers to spirituality uh, comes from Kemet. The uh, centralization of spirituality we were taught was in Jerusalem, but it wasn't. It was in Kemet. Now, why why do we why did we embrace our Jerusalem as being uh, the center of spirituality because of what Jerusalem means? And what we found is that. Jerusalem is everywhere if you're righteous. You are the place of righteousness. And, and the center of spiritual mysticism is in Kemet. And the reason that we were led away from Kemet uh, to Jerusalem is because um, the, the mysticism was not understood. It was a, an attempt made uh, to um, understand it but not being able to understand it, Egypt then became a study. Uh, the whole of Kemet became uh, academic, uh, uh, or um, a study, meaning that it was looked at academically as opposed to spiritually. And, and the spiritual essence of things were moved uh, to this place called Jerusalem when the Bible actually does not have a history uh, of um, a history that we can point to in terms of the places and the things that happened in the Bible. Uh, for example, there is no historical record at all of um, Hebrews being held in slavery in Egypt or in Kemet. We see how I keep saying Egypt. That's how deeply this stuff is ingrained in us. Um, there's no historical um, record of that ever happening. So, so if the Bible is an, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to say the word I'm looking for, allegory. If, if the Bible is an allegory, and it is, then. What happened? What do we do with this uh, Egyptian? I'm, I'm sorry, the um, he, he break uh, mentioning of um, slavery. Suppose that the Bible itself is a puzzle. If you take the pieces to a puzzle and put them in a box, the the uh, beginning of uh, the edges of that puzzle may very well be in the bottom or mixed in the middle, middle of it, but you have to pull little pieces out of it in order to put it together to see what the image it presents. So suppose the uh, allegory about Jesus is not just a New Testament. The allegory about Jesus is another part of the puzzle. And <clears throat> we can look at this purported uh, enslavement and, and see it as a message. Suppose the message is to us. Because it is said that, that um, the Hebrews were in Kemet for 400 years. Have you guys heard that? Come on, you Bible people. I'm not Bible, but our church folks. Have yep. we not been taught that? That's that 400 years now. Suppose that's speaking to the 400 years of enslavement that we experienced in this country. 
and we are now in the wilderness. If um, that is true, and it is, then we have to begin to see the Bible uh, in pieces and pull those pieces together to give us a clear picture of what's happening. Uh, and this journey of doing that became clearer when we when we uh, recognized that in Mark, um, Jesus was uh, mentioned in Pata. And now we see uh, Amun being mentioned by Jesus saying that he's Amun. So all of, all of the, the, um, of the Bible is a message that is not in order. The, uh, for the express purpose of not, what am I trying to say? It's not, <clears throat> suppose that the, uh, these records of these allegories are the flaming sword, the, 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 the fact that they don't run sequentially. Suppose it is a flaming sword to keep uh, us, uh, mankind, or humanity, uh, from uh, putting the puzzle together. And that flaming sword is um, your mindset. And when your mindset begins to change, um, that the flaming sword simply means that you are at that point able to rightly divide the truth from the lie. The sword represents that and the fire represents uh, the pure desire that you, that you have uh, to travel this journey. Suppose that is true. And if, if it is true, uh, then, then what we are actually beginning to do at this juncture uh, is to put the puzzle together so we can see clearly. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. It makes sense. And just to add to that, um, in, in my readings, I've come across um, some information about Jews being in, in, in Egypt since before Jesus and even after Jesus, and that they, they set up a temple and they called that place Jerusalem. Not because of location, but because of the meaning of the word. Um, there was a, 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 a huge sect of Jews that lived in Egypt. Thank you. And, and the uh, if we look at in, in, in indigenous religions on the continent of Africa, all of it leads back to uh, Egypt. I'm not, and I'm not talking about um, the manipulation of Christianity and Islam. I'm talking about people who are pretty much untouched by the Western mindset. Uh, yeah, all of it goes back to, uh, has its origin rather, uh, in, in Kemet, not only that, uh, if you look at the, the um, expressions of worship, for lack of a better term, or submission, uh, it is to one deity. All of it leads back to one deity, except Christianity. Christianity says it has one deity, and, and that deity it, uh, actually has a plural name, but they don't uh, uh, admit that at all. So anyway, I'm done. Pastor, mm -hmm. I have a I have a question. I have a comment slash question. So you made a very profound statement about that we are Kemet, and what came to me was when the African slaves will sing the song about crossing Jordan. Did they know what they were talking about? Because I'm thinking about the Jordan River. We being Kemet, is there a connection there? Because that's yeah. what I saw when you said that we are Kemet. It, it, <sighs> there is a message. Help me. There is a message. The, the closer you get to enslavement in terms of the songs that were uh, rendered uh, or the, the uh, lyrics of the songs, uh, the more, uh, the clearer you begin to see the connection with the origin 
of the of enslaved Africans. Um, this idea of um, Swing Low Sweet Chariot was not just a song that um, was, was sung when there was an escape plan. Um, the closer you get back to the beginning of the enslavement of the African, you begin to see that these, all of these songs are spiritually connected. And we were much more aware of spirituality than we thought we were. Education killed us when it came to um, uh, being uh, spiritual. And if we look at what happened, uh, we started doing these um, the hymns, some of which have no meaning whatsoever. Yet, the songs that were rendered uh, in prayer meetings, uh, uh, the raising of the uh, what we called hymns, because they were told to call them the the um the little, what's that book? The book where you line a hymn and and they you pat your feet and, and you, you sing to the rhythm of it. The, so all yep. of these um, messages from from um, the African mindset. Does that help you? <clears throat> yes, sir. I, when when you said that, something just went through me because the slaves knew they knew that it wasn't a physical place where they were going. It was spiritual. It was home. It was who they are, who we are. So yeah, that opened up a lot to me. Thank you. Um. Uh, and let me say this, and I think uh, Nick had something to add to this. Um, off the coast of Savannah, Georgia, uh, there was a group of um, enslaved Africans brought, brought, brought to that port. And one of the captured Africans was a king of the village. And when they docked at Savannah, the king got off and walked back into the ocean. And all of the enslaved people who were captured followed the king into the ocean. And there is no record of what happened to them. But there were when they walked back into the ocean, it was um in, in those who witnessed it saying that it was like they just disappeared. Because there were there were no bodies floating. There was nothing was left to say that to, that um, they died in the water. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So the question becomes, why is it that they could walk into that water and there's no evidence of them drowning? Did they know that they were going to exit the bodies as they walked into the waters? Did they actually exit the bodies? That, and, or were they able to do as Jesus did? And that is manifest in a body on the other side of the uh, ocean. As, as the story about Jesus being manifested after the resurrection. Does that make sense? Questions, comments? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, your comment? Nick? Um, just about the spiritual lineage that goes all the way back to Kemet has such a strong connection still. Um, but it is sort of the, the way religion has become confused that takes that energy, that connection, and perverts it into something that is distorted. But it is instinctive in all of us, uh, especially uh, Africans who have ancestry uh, in that part of the world, uh, to remember the method by which you can awaken spiritually again, even in the midst of uh, horrible circumstances. But it is the 
overwhelming influence of Kemetic spirituality was known to everyone, including Europeans. Um, if you take a look at the Vatican itself, there's all kinds of references to it, even in the sculptures uh, and paintings that are around Vatican City. But I just say that to point out the fact that they understood that and used it for their own selfish intention. Um, but it is uh, kind of like a uh, a collective remembrance that we all have of a time when we were aware of and remembered the true nature of who and what we were, or more so than now. And that still echoes in our uh, in our past, uh, and it connects us to that past because outside of this physical experience, time doesn't really mean as much. Um, that reality is still present, and because it was such a powerful example of what a uh, society more focused on spiritual development can do, it still connects us to that experience, and we still remember it. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Ron? Okay. Um, I want to read something to you from Ezekiel, okay? Ezekiel, mm -hmm. I mean, Ezekiel 29. It says, For thus says the Lord God, at the end of the 40 years, I will gather the Egyptians from the people peoples among whom they were scattered. I return the fortune of Egypt and make them return to the land of Petros, to the land of their origin. And there will be a lowly kingdom. Uh, what kind of kingdom run? A lowly, L-O-W-L-Y. Okay. Lowly kingdom. It will be the lowest of the kingdoms that will never again left itself up against the nations and I will make them so small that they will not rule over nations uh, return to the land of Petros Petros talks about uh, it, it talks about a, a, a southern land uh, excuse me let me get it right it talks about oh, come on Yeah, the southern land uh, being in, in the upper Egypt. Well, Audrey, Audrey said the Egyptians, there were Egyptians, excuse me, uh, Israelite uh, Jews living in Egypt, at the, you know, before Christ, had, and that is true. So I'm taking it these were Africans, though, and not Jews. Is that well, they were, they were uh, Hebrews. They were Hebrews. Hebrews yes. Yes. That, that were labeled as Jews in later years. Okay. Cause that makes a difference. Uh, and and I, I was, you know, based on our discussions, trying to find references to this in in the scriptures. And, and uh, Ezekiel chapter fourteen is very interesting. The whole thing is about Egypt, and 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 even in uh, what other fellow name? One or the other. Daniel? Not Daniel. Uh, Jeremiah talks about, it talks a lot about Egypt. So I just thought that was all interesting. So what we are actually seeing then is that um, it is impossible to um, or remove the threat of uh, Kemet or Egypt from, from the writings of old meaning of antiquity, meaning that no matter what you read, you, it's going to lead you back to uh, Kemet. And it's up to you to make uh, to have the desire for a, a uh, different type of consciousness, a pure consciousness. And that is 
where the point of division comes between the lie and the truth. The separation, rather, between the lie and the truth. But right now, what we have been dealing with, especially before we started the journey, is a mixture uh, of the two, and the lie prevailed because the liars were in charge of um, everything. When it talks about making it smaller, um, making the um, kingdom smaller, and they will not be able to rule over um, other people, other nations, um, could that possibly mean, and I think it does, that with the period where we are now, with all the chaos uh, that is that exists in the society, be it um, America or the other parts of the world, with the greater being in America, of course, could that possibly mean uh, that when when uh, we see, when we experience um, balance, that um, that's when the nation will be constructed? Uh, on the uh, and the foundation of a country removed, and the um, is not talking about a minimum of people or the 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 um, smallness of people as much as it is talking about um, the minute expressions of of um, of um, spiritual dominance and, and spiritual manipulation. Can you see that, Ron? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do see that. I, I had a question for you. And, and it may not be fair that I kind of took that out of context because you know how Ezekiel is written. Yes. And I tried to read it from the beginning of that chapter and I didn't really understand it all. So I, 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 I saw that and I kind of pulled it out of there and that may not have been fair to do that either. But the, the thought that crossed my mind was this. What we know now about Kemet and what we are seeing, does it change our vision of what happened? With Because you notice that all of the patriarchs, with the exception of Jacob, everybody spends time in Egypt. Uh, even Joseph takes his family through Egypt. It appears to be a place of comfort in a time of distress. So based on what we know now, do we see that differently or do we want to add something to that? Egypt can be a cramped space, but I don't believe, let me put it this way, the translation of Egypt in the Bible speaks to a cramped space. Mm -hmm. The understanding of Kemet, of Egypt, from those who were the writers of that, uh, in, in reference to the God of, of Egypt or the gods, did not see it as a cramped space. So how does Egypt become a cramp space? Maybe, yes, maybe it should not have been Egypt written there. Maybe it should have been translated as what it means, a cramp space. See what I'm talking about, Ron? Yeah. So maybe we need to look more closely at the, uh, there's no maybe there, we definitely need to look more closely at um, the translations of that. Just like we thought that Jesus was saying, I am a man, a man right? Yeah. And he was saying, I am. Uh, just like we ignored uh, when Jesus talked about Fatah, we were taught that that was a part of the um, language of, uh, uh, of the um, Hebrew but it was not the language, but we, it was never interpreted for us as Fatah in reference to Egypt. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, go ahead. My, my mind's working. I, I wonder when 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 Pharaoh tries or, or does take Sarah, and I think the same happens to Isaac. Is that an attempt to kind of uh, control the spirituality of, of man? Yes, uh, I so, would say yes. Okay, so I, I'm trying the cramped space thing. It, I think is real, or uh, and the other part is the enslaving of them is a is another way of making it a cramped space or the control of it. Try, I'm going to control you, or uh, and not only do I will I control you. I will make you, I will force you to be what I need you to be. You will be laborers or whatever. And I'm, I'm looking at it from the books, but I want to see it from a spiritual side uh, because I, I'm, I'm seeing two different, uh, having two different thoughts of Kemet and, and trying to pull them together. Um. Let me make a suggestion. Okay. Uh, that we do some in-depth uh, research to understand uh, how that was translated to be Egypt, okay? Okay. The other thing is we need to make every effort um, to uh, speak about what you read in Ezekiel as well as everything else in the scriptures. Speak about them in in this sense of it being an allegory. Um, every one of us had to be have been in a cramped space. Yes. We were cramped in religion. We were cramped in academia. And what we uh, have begun to do is to stretch our legs, so to speak, move out of that uh, cramped space. And, that, and you don't do that until you are, are tired of being tired, meaning that um, you are spiritually in bondage or you're enslaved spiritually and you are a slave to religion and everything else that's connected to it until you begin to uh, free yourself. And that freedom comes by understanding and embracing who you are. Does that make sense so far? Yes. yes. Now, I have a question. Uh huh. Uh, is there a correlation between the cramped space and uh, a baby being in the room, or is it totally different? Hmm. That's a good question. That is a good question. Uh, could it possibly be that the baby in that womb is no different than being in uh, dark spaces, which um. It's a space of wisdom. Could it be that? And once it, it exits uh, the waters, the, the umbilical fluids, um, it comes out of the darkness to the light. And suppose that when children start talking about imaginary friends, they are not imaginary. And we've talked about this before at length. Uh, suppose they are visions that they are having and they never get them mixed up. And my supposition continues with um, them being talked out of what they see because we begin to close their eye as opposed to doing everything possible to keep it uh, open. For, um, I don't know, yeah, open. So, uh, suppose that we are blinding the eye by Say so you don't have an imaginary friend, they don't exist. And, and um, further uh, pulling them into an embracing of a material world that really is an illusion as opposed to the reality that they were born seeing. Does that make sense, Mara? It does, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah. The, uh... All those things are like mirrors of each other. The path we take through life is the path of uh, spiritual development and evolution. 
um, it is the sort of spiritual mirror of the physical evolution that we go through because the purpose of physical life is that as you grow and gain more experience you begin to evolve spiritually so it's uh the whole story of the human from developing into a baby spiritually into an adult spiritually is the same one told by uh, uh kemetic spirituality it is actually the same one told by the bible uh which would have taken place uh, sort of after the, the height of the spiritual time period of Kemet. Um, so it's all a mirror of each other, in a way, just told through the lens of different sort of cultural contexts in terms of the Bible, but physically, metaphysically, um, yeah, being present in the womb of your mother is like the... Uh, um, the, the 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 point just before let there be light essentially in uh, in genesis in a way um i think there's more to it than that but that's what i feel and believe based on how these things are related yeah um no well, would you when you said that some came to mind and that is if we look at the birth of creation it's the same principle of being in a womb. The same principle of being in a womb. Mm -hmm. um, so the birth of a child is, is, is a reminder of the birth of creation itself, coming from a dark space. And, and that child has a sense of oneness with that creation. Um, you have a question? Foundation? Premel? Who's on at Foundation? Would you mute, please? Thank you. Um, can you see, uh, is that along the lines you were speaking? To? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, and that's it get off track or whatever, but the, the indigenous peoples and uh, more spiritually connected societies perceive uh, or imagine the creator to be feminine, not masculine. Because the first place you uh, begin to develop consciousness within this physical existence is within your mother. And it's that same thing as you think of the, the earth or the universe. Um, so as you go further away from that understanding, you begin, you essentially become more patriarchal, uh, which patriarchy in and of itself is generally overbearing. Uh, but I'm not saying that masculinity is negative. I'm saying that the way in which uh, you become confused as you move away from the original spiritual understanding tends to lead in the direction of in uh, a sort of uh, more extreme form of what masculinity is, anyway. And, and that, if we look at that based upon creation, whether we look at it in the scriptures or look at it um, in Kemet or look at creation based upon historic, uh, any historical context, rather, we talk about the Twa, and we're talking about every uh, all humans coming from the womb of a female. Um, that that one the uh, mother gene that's in everyone. Uh, so what happened with that? Is it that that once um, the um, uh, the human uh, came from the womb uh, and it, the uh, mother being recognized as the deity of birth of all and maleness, uh, the um, masculine energy sought to subdue um, the uh, spiritual nature of um, the, the feminine energy. And we, we see that um, develop, um, come into existence more as we move out of Kemet. 
as we move out of Kemet, and as we um, force indigenous people around the world to give up their beliefs in favor of uh, what we say it should be as, as a, um, a European society, a European mindset, that that in itself is what, what actually comes from one of the uh, philosophers, I think it's Locke, that um, one, no, it's not Machiavelli, right? Makes sure, um, what is it? Um, might makes right. In other words, if you have the power, um, you have the right to do what you want to do because you're stronger. Now, and, and that in itself uh, is the confusion that I think Nick was talking about in, in terms of uh, masculine energy. And, and what happened is that if, you, if we look at that, what do we say uh, uh, in our society, not just us individually, but in the society itself? Men are not supposed to cry. A man doesn't cry. Um, if a man has love and kindness and forgiveness, et cetera, uh, he's, called, he's said to be soft, uh, effeminate effeminate, uh, he, uh, as opposed to um, being the uh, essence of his origin. So what we, when we talk about that, man is not supposed to cry. Man is supposed to be strong enough to defend himself, blah, 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 the whole nine yards. is, is, is the uh, complexity of the confusion uh, that, um, that lends itself to male dominance in the earth. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that started, um, that, that was introduced. We were told that this was going to happen. We were told that there was going to be uh, our desire of male dominant, the male energies are, are going to desire to um, be dominant. The, the scripture says that um, and there shall be an energy between feminine and masculine energy, does it not? In Genesis, when an enmity between the, the male and female. So that's that we were told that we were also um, shown that um, when when troubles when when trouble appears. Uh, the person who's going uh, to have the faith, who's going to be charged with the blame uh, is, is feminine energy. We were told all of these things in the allegory of the scriptures. We were told these things. And um, I believe that, and please, please correct me if you see it differently. I believe that the reason the Bible was written uh, and all the, uh, the uh, stories, the allegories in the Bible, I believe that they were written for the African in America. Because if you go through the stories, the allegories in the scriptures, you would see our plight over and over again. The enslaved, you would see it over and over again. The 400 years in Egypt, right? Think about this other part of it. For 400 years, the heavens were shut up. From Malachi to, to Matthew, right? Is that not what we were taught? That God um, did not speak for 400 years? What does it say? If that was true, then we wouldn't be living if God didn't speak for 400 years. If God didn't speak for four seconds, we wouldn't be here. So what is what is being hidden <clears throat> between Malachi and Matthew? Could it be the pseudepigrapher? Uh, all, the, all the books that are that were taken out. Would uh, fill in that gap 
between Malachi and um, and Matthew? Could it, could that be it? Could that be the gap between <clears throat> 1865 and now? The struggles that we have endured, the religion, the religious attitude that we have without understanding what spirituality really is, could that be that period? And I'm really offering suppositions about um, the uh, scriptures being written for that purpose. <clears throat> Because they, the scriptures speak primarily of the plight of what happens in this nation. Could it very well be <clears throat> that um, that we were brought to this place and because of our being here, this country is deemed to be the wealthiest and the strongest. So what made it wealthy? The labor, the labor of enslaved people, did it not? <laughs> That's what made it wealthy. So everyone looks to this country. Look at the the um, how frantic uh, Europe is, as well as um, well Europe in particular is about what's happening in Gaza, and they are frantic because the U.S. will not speak to it in the term that sh it should be spoken of. It will not say genocide. And the rest of um, the European nations are waiting for the US to make that statement, which means that everyone is looking to this country, which brings me back to my point that we are in the midst, we are in the belly of the beast. And the other part of that is this, how many, how many countries of color are in NATO? None. None. There are no countries of color in uh, countries or nations of color in, in uh, NATO. So the NATO uh, alliance is to, is to um, maintain control over the world. And the one who is blowing it all up says that if you don't pay, NATO is not going to protect you. America is not going to war for anybody in NATO who don't pay their bills. Is that not Trump? Is that not the chaos that we're living with right now? And everybody went crazy, meaning that the people in the NATO alliance went crazy because America is the dominant force in the world, which means that America is the um, source of chaos in the world. And in the, in the belly of this chaos, here we are. And if we are doing what we are doing and we understand that it's very possible and, and, and um, plausible that we are the uh, only group we know or the only group that exists who travel in this journey that we're traveling. And if, uh, if we are in the belly of the whale, the belly of the fish, so God prepared a fish for John, God prepared a fish and we are in the belly of it. And it's time for us uh, to um, act accordingly. So all that stuff I, I've said, I know I said a lot in regards to um, our being, I mean, the scripture being uh, um, for us in terms of our plight. Uh, and we, that book has guided us back to Kimmy. Because that's where we started with the Bible. Am I right? And this guy goes back to Kenya. So is this a playbook that we are to use to bring spirituality into the earth? Is this the playbook that has been given to us so we can see clearly that we are indeed gods? We are indeed, um, as we have been saying, Elohim, one yet many, 
and he's taking us all the way back to Amon-Ra, which is the same thing, one yet many. Would you, would you distinguish, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Would you distinguish between the African, uh, when you say the book was written for the African, and the idea of the African mindset? and how that fits together. Okay, thank you for correcting me. I appreciate that because I, I don't, I'm not talking about um, only people. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the African uh, with a mindset of forgiveness and love and kindness, that, that mindset, which means that uh, any Caucasian can also have that mindset or any European rather can have that mindset. And that's the difference between a European mindset and a Caucasian mindset. The Caucasian mindset is congruent with the African mindset. And, and there are people who, uh, who originated in Africa, whose origin is from Africa, and they have a um, European mindset. People like Ben Carson and um, the, um, I guess my mind just don't even want to remember his name. Tim Scott. <laughs> Tim Scott. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, so they have a European mindset, but they are not Caucasian. Does that, does that help, Barbara, or does that meet your question? No, that's, that's, that's exactly where I was headed because. Uh, depending on who's listening, it, it could, having not understood what the African mindset is, they wouldn't necessarily know that that's what you meant. Thanks. And, and I want to ask you too, everyone who hear, who hear my voice, I want you, when we talk about that, I want you to bring us back to the understand, ask the question about what do we mean so that we can repeat that mindset, uh, the explanation, as often as possible, uh, and, and I think that will that that I know that that will help because if you were to take it the way I said it prior to Barbara uh, bringing up what she did, then um, it could very easily uh, be misconstrued as being uh, an exercise in racism when that is not that is not the case at all. So anyway, <laughs> go ahead. Is it possible that we at this time can be reconstructing the, the, the energy, if you will, or uh, repurposing the energy in Kemet as we study this? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I'm I'm trying to talk it through. Uh, I see what you're saying. I'm thinking. If 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 you look at this, we what we have discovered is we're seeing that Kemet was the uh, I'm gonna use for for this discussion the origin for seeking truth, and the the spirituality existed there in between. The, the, the time that the Bible was written, that was watered down or that mindset changed. Uh, and I think opportunities to re-establish itself or repurpose itself happens when first Abraham and then Isaac and so on goes to travel there and, and follow with me. I know we're talking uh, uh, energy is here, not a place. But instead, what they did was they raped the women or made them into objects of beauty rather than seeing the beauty. Uh, and in doing so, further deteriorated the concept of what it was supposed to be. So there comes one 
who seeks truth and understands what that truth looked like originally. And whereas the concept of Egypt was not supposed to be in originally a cramped space, but a place that, a Kemet rather, not a cramped space, but in, in the original set, it was a place that brought about harmony in the earth and fed people and educated people and took care of the world. And it moved away from that when it was uh, invaded by greed and selfishness. So is this an attempt to repurpose that original um, purpose for the energy there. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of rambling now, but I think you, you see what my question is. I do. I, I don't think it's a repurposing at all. Okay. I, I think it is an awakening. And, uh, and I think that the idea of um, being woke is a reality that's recognized by the chaotic energy. And it seeks to make being woke uh, something that is um, to be feared or to uh, walk away from or to turn your back on that or something that's detrimental to society. The awakening um, of um, what Kemet is for us is, is getting its um, challenges uh, from those who want to maintain power. So they have to keep everyone asleep. And that's why they talks about being woke. The other thing is that I don't, the reason rather, I don't believe it's me uh, repurposed uh, is, is that it's because the energy of Kemet uh, is the energy, er, the energy of spirituality for, and that energy of spirituality that governed Kemet is the energy of of uh, harmony, uh, uh, the the energy of um, the the uh, love and kindness, all of those attributes. So it, rather than being repurposed, with the, that energy being repurposed, uh, I, I see if we're going to use that word repurposed. I, I see it more with the European mindset having to be repurposed as opposed to using that energy to keep uh, humanity in bondage uh, under the thumb. Um, so the energy that we that we are exploring out of Kemet is the energy that repurposes that by changing the mindset. Does that make sense? What? Yeah. Um, I, I, as you I, talk, uh -huh. go ahead, Barbara. As you as you talk, uh, what what I thought about was the Black Panther and the city where they lived, and people would either see one thing or the other. One thing they would see are individuals, uh, 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 you know, living in. Uh, what seems like poverty and, 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 and tilling the earth uh, with their own strength and, and you know, the, the, the huts that they lived in. On the other hand, behind that scene was the, mo what was that city? The modern city. And so those were the two extremes and you could potentially perceive that you were in a cramped space in one situation uh, as opposed to Kemet in another situation, they're both the same. It's all in how awakened you are to the energy of Kemet that resonates. It's, it's what you it's what you see, and how uh, how awakened or uh, enlightened you are. I can see that, Robert. Yeah, I see that because. Yeah. Wakanda yeah. was Egypt, was Alchemist. 
if you look at the modernization, the modern aspects of it, and compare it to uh, Kim, Kim was more advanced than any other nation on the face of the earth. See, that was, that was, my, that was my point. It became a cramped space, but that's not what it was originally. It was came a cramped space when the name was changed. Oh, you talking about when the Greeks changed it? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. O originally, it was freedom. It was it was it was oneness. It, it made the world a community. If you go yeah. back and look at the history that we discussed when, when you when you were talking about. The, 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 the universities and, and the medicines and, and, and all the things that they did and, and teaching around the world and, and spreading wealth. That's what it was originally. The whole world was a community, but somewhere along the line, it became a cramped space. Uh, that's so clear. Yeah, it's, I think I was saying that last night, but every place sort of follows the same pattern. Eventually there's the the fall into religious confusion. Yeah. Um, and that's also what happened to Egypt. And, and if you yeah. look at the, the uh, dominant places of Christianity, all of it is centered. Now, don't get me wrong, Christianity is all over Africa. However, if you look at East Africa, Uganda, um, Kenya, Ethiopia, these are places of, of um, note where um, Christianity is king. And I'm talking about evangelical Christianity, especially in Uganda. So that in itself is a cramped space. Does that make sense, Ron? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, it, it, I would like for you guys, if you can, uh, have opportunity to um, look at a map of Africa and look at the locations of um, from Zambia up to Tanzania, Somalia, Ethiopia, come up the East Coast all the way up to um, Kemet, and 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 you will see uh, where Christianity was pushed the hardest. Uh, where um, life was lost because of a refusal to abandon the spiritual essence of their being, meaning the African's being. Um, and nobody cares. Think about this. In 1945, what, 45, 45, yeah. During that course of World War II, because it wasn't just one year, during the course of World War II, six million people were put in a gas chamber, right? Mm -hmm. Not counting the hundreds of thousands of gypsies, and, uh, and I, don't, I use that term gypsy very loosely, Romanians, let me put it that way, Romanians and, and um, people of African descent. So let's say that uh, that adds up, to, brings us to a number of eight million people. In, in 1899, I think it was 1998, something during that period, King Leopold, if you total what he, he killed, is 20 million people. And that does not count the, the people who were killed by the British, uh, by the US by other, you know, uh, European countries. So why am I bringing this up? If 6 million people were killed and you, you, you're reminding everyone of that, is that not saying you don't care about the others, the, the Africans? You don't care about the Romanian? The only one you care about are, is yourself? You don't even mention the reality that people of African descent um, liberated the concentration camp at um, in, in one of them uh, that I was trying to call his name, Auschwitz. Um, people of African descent liberated 
from that, uh, the um, prisoners from that camp. And no one talks about or cares about the 20 plus million plus Africans who were killed. Why is that so? Because the only important thing in that European mindset is the protection of people who look like them. You have to have that European, European mindset is protective of itself as opposed to being protective of everyone. That's why you have NATO. That's the reason you have um, Biden knows that Netanyahu is killing him in, in terms of his reelection. Yet he, he continues to uh, follow the line of um, Netanyahu. He appears to desire uh, or have a desire for the Palestinians to be terminated from the face of this earth or to be forced into a different place so Europeans can control the whole of um, Palestine. Uh, and and um, the loudest cries for change is coming from people of color. You would be amazed at the would you uh, mute your palm, please? You'd be amazed at the number of Africans who are not going to vote in this election because of their solidarity with the Palestinians. Yet, Biden still is still holding on to the protection of the European, regardless of the devastation that's being done to people of color. Our responsibility in this is to awaken the minds of everyone so that, uh, the, awaken the soul, so that uh, this would take an abrupt change, um, an abrupt turn. Um, the uh, mindset of the European worldwide is Biden. The mindset of enslavement in America is Trump. And those two mindsets are the problems with what's of the chaos, the birth of the chaos that's that's taking place in the uh, in the world. I mean worldwide. Uh, those two attitudes is what brings um us to, the, to where we are now. And greed has always been in the forefront. And if Trump does not represent that greed, tell me what does. So what do I see in that? And I'm going to shut up in a minute. So what do I see in that? When it says that Trump don't have the money to pay, he's broke in, in, in regards to the fines that he has to pay, right? What is that saying to us? Your greed has brought you to the brink of poverty. The very thing that you relied on for your power is being taken away from you. And you're enrich you're rich you're enriching being enriched um, by the work of those who you don't even care for is coming to an end. And the, the whole, the power that you exert over the world is what Biden represents. And it's coming to an end as well. And all of this is before us now. And the, the greatest power that we have over these situations, these circumstances 
is what we are doing right now. This is more powerful than anybody's vote because it influences everything on this earth, not just the humans, but the trees, the grass, everything. It, it influences everything because we were told to dominate, set boundaries so that spirituality can prevail. I'm done. What? Yeah, I'm just I'm just sitting here listening, you know, contemplating what you just said because, you know, what do you is there a third party I don't know about? Is there something you know? It it it, it just so uh, just it, it just looks kind of bleak, but but yeah, a, as you describe what what both of them represent, uh. But yeah, I, I, I've talked to a number of people as well that talked about not voting. Just and, and people are just so uh, kind of disheartened. They're just just so uh, a little discouraged by all of this. We can't afford to be disheartened. If 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 knowing what go, if what's happening is disheartened to you, stop watching TV. We cannot accomplish uh, what we are supposed to accomplish on this journey if we look at what we see and we internalize that is bleak. It is also an illusion, just like everything else. It is not reality. Does that make sense, Mr. Ron? It does. I'm, I'm just answering. I'm just talking about what you, what you were saying, though. Yeah, I know. I, I, I'm not saying with you. I'm I'm just encouraging us yeah. uh, on this phone, I mean, on this call to, to be vigilant and, and not to um, um, feel what the, the, that nothing is going to change. That's what I'm saying. Oh, tomorrow, California, before I forget it again. So, uh, Ron? Okay. Questions or comments, anybody? Mm -hmm. Might be a good time to kind of sit pause. And pause right here and reflect. You trying to find another word other than pause? You know that's your pause, word. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Good discussion. Okay. Good discussion. Uh, have a great day and look forward to tomorrow morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome.